I usually laugh harder than most people would. <laughs> We're all in to BYU TV Sports. Watch BYU take on Westminster live this Thursday at 9 Eastern, 7 Mountain. Watch all of your favorite BYU teams on BYU TV, your home for Cougar Sports. You're watching BYU TV on KBYU DT Provo Salt Lake City. Hello once again, Cougar Nation. Welcome back inside the Coordinator's Corner, brought to you by JCW's, the Burger Boys. We're headed to November with BYU 4-4 four and four on the season. Three October home games have come and gone. They got one out of the three. Cougs will now hit the road for three of their final four, starting Saturday at Boise State. BYU looking to bounce back after a 7-6 home loss to Northern Illinois this past weekend. On today's show, special teams coordinator Ed Lamb and defensive coordinator Elisa Tuiaki joining me. Coach Lamb in the first half hour, Coach Tuiaki in the final 30 minutes. We are broadcast live on BYU TV, BYU Radio, Sirius XM 143 and 107.9 FM along the Wasatch Front, as well as the BYU Football Facebook Live page and ESPN 960 AM. You can catch the show live and on demand at BYUtv.org, BYUradio.org, plus the BYU TV and BYU Radio apps. And we invite your questions, as always, for the coaches on social media using the hashtag CCBYU or via comments on BYU Football Facebook Live. To start today's show, special teams coordinator, linebackers coach, and assistant head coach Ed Lamb is with us. And uh, NIU winning Saturday uh, with not a great offensive day from their standpoint, but they do force the game's only turnover. And Key uh, was keeping BYU out of the end zone on the two red zone uh, penetrations and tough to win games with six points, and that was the scenario on Saturday. Yep, you said it well. Yeah, we, uh, very disappointing for us not to be able to get the victory. Uh, it's crushing, really, for the coaching staff. We feel like we have a good enough team that if uh, we do our jobs correctly and well, that we should be able to lead the boys to victory, and it didn't happen. Uh, bouncing around a bit, we go to the end of the game, and BYU makes, I think, a prudent call uh, to punt uh, near midfield. You can go either way on this thing, but on fourth and four, the plan was to punt and pin, and that worked out. Uh, defense did a job. BYU gets the ball back with timeouts and two minutes to play, needing only a field goal, needing to go maybe 50 yards. I'm sure you felt that the strategy was about to pay off for you. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I heard the, the, the boos. You know, the, the fans wanted to go for them fourth down. I, under, I understand that. Uh, and, and in a different game, that may have been the right call. But you know, we were we had only completed one third down pass the whole game for, for first down yardage. And we really, you know, the, but and we had held them to to three and four and five play series uh, several times on defense. So uh, credit them for um, the punt, really, I think, was the difference on that whole exchange. Uh, they got us into a fourth and five. Credit them for that. Uh, that was not a good, uh, by any means, not good odds for us to complete that uh, fourth and five. Uh, but did did get the stop, pin them deep in their own territory, as as we had uh, as the analytics or odds would have suggested. And then when they ripped off the 56 yarder, that put us closer to our own 35 rather than closer to the 50. Usually, in that situation, you expect to get uh, possession on a three and out near the 50 yard line, and, and we didn't get that done. Uh, their punter had a good day, uh, certainly, and his biggest punt came at the most important time at the end of the game. He did. That, that one, uh, the correct decision by Mike Shelton on that one, it landed on the four-yard line, and, and uh, you know, any special teams uh, uh, returner will tell you, you know, don't, don't back up inside the 10-yard line, um, especially not inside the five-yard line. That thing bounced on the four and, and then, uh, and then took, a, took a turn out uh, just, just before it hit, had it tip the pylon, pylon one inch, uh, more toward the end zone, it, it would have been called uh, a touchback, and so that was a that was a great job by their punter to get it down that tight. BYU defense did a great job in keeping the game to where BYU could have one possession to win it. Uh, NIU averaged less than a yard per play in the fourth quarter. They weren't able to go anywhere, and that's what you wanted to, you know, like I said, keep your, yourselves with a chance to have a, uh, to win it. Yeah, exactly. It was just that was just an odds odds thing, and you know everybody on the. The coaching staff was in lockstep agreement on that decision right there. Uh, BYU goes from its, uh, interestingly, its season high in play success rate against Hawaii to a season low in play success rate against Northern Illinois. Now, we knew the NIU defense was legit, and they did prove it again against BYU. It's a good group. 
Oh, they sure, yeah, sure are. And you know, as as coaches, we we always uh, strive to to give credit where credit is due. And and certainly, NIU's defense played with a lot of emotion and um, a, a lot of success. They had a lot of success. They they rushed the passer really well. They got into our backfield. Uh, they put a lot of guys in there in the in the running game and were able to bottle up the runs at times during the game. At other times, I thought our rushing game was was going really well and it just it wasn't consistent enough but the but the biggest thing was uh just the, the missed opportunities there uh, we had a first and 10 uh in the high red zone where we didn't come away with a field goal we ended up losing some yardage and having to to try a 51 yarder which is within uh range but you know range is a range is a funny word i mean a half court sh- shot in basketball is in range but it's uh you know the percentage goes down and uh so uh, gosh i wish uh i wish we we uh, would have hit that uh, 51 yard would have ended up being the game winner and then we had the first and goal on the five and yep. and some more uh some more misexecution there that and didn't turn that into a touchdown some backing up there uh, certainly now we know that uh, niu has played some good teams and played them well uh utah is a really good football team and they struggled to score it against niu and dekalb so they've been a, a, a good defensive group from start to finish played a tough schedule and uh they head back into their league now at four and oh and they're proving that uh, you don't have to have the most prolific offense in the world to win football games which is what they are doing right now primarily on defense yeah, yeah that's right and and you know, we talk about odds. Uh, you know, the odds were that uh, having four downs all the way in there on our final drive, odds were we were going to win that game. I mean, everything was shaping up to be a defensive a victory, and the offense do what's necessary. And uh, you know, four downs is a, is a lot of downs when you know you have it going all the way in like that. Only needing a field goal, touchdown would have been bonus. So. I think our offense did, you know, everything that was needed to win a defensive game. So did their offense. They ended up winning. The one thing we did we did that they didn't do is turn it over. And from a defensive standpoint, the one thing they did that we didn't do is take it away. And the one turnover came on BYU's final look. And uh, looking back at it, uh, what did you and Zach see or not see on the pick? Um, yeah, you know, Coach Coach Roderick and Zach would probably characterize it in in uh, a, a more detailed way and and maybe more insightful but uh, it, it looked to me like um, something that had been there earlier in the game you know when when they got into that situation they were a little bit different defense uh, it was a, a crossing route and the underneath coverage just kind of got underneath it late and it's one of those things that sometimes can look open um, mm. from uh, from the front side especially early in the game when the defense is more aggressive and in that situation they just got underneath the route Dating back to the Bronco Mendenhall era, BYU had won uh, 17 straight games when leading at halftime. That streak ended on Saturday, but the lead was only three. It was gone uh, just a few minutes into the third quarter, as it turned out. It's now four consecutive games, Coach, that the opponents have scored touchdowns on their first possession of the second half. Has it felt like that to you? Does that, uh, I mean, that's interesting that BYU from the start of games have been really good, and the start of second halves have been uh, pretty consistently scoring for the other side right now. Yeah, that's a really good, it's it's something that we look at coming out of every game is when the scores happen, when the breakdowns happen. And a, and a couple of things, uh, you know, as coaches, we, we have to we have to try to do our best job of determining whether um, adjustments are made by the opponent and uh, or whether our team is making uh, more mistakes in those critical areas. And in this particular game, it was uh, it was a mistake filled drive there. And so um, and, and that's not to say that that's always uh, that's always the case. There's a lot of times when it's when the, the opponent makes a better adjustment and, and we, then we have to counter punch and try to come back. There wasn't a lot of margin for error and uh, no opportunity to really make a counter punch matter. I uh, felt like uh, their their offense stayed with what they did. There were no adjustments. It was just uh, we we had some some ill timed mistakes on that drive. And it started with a kickoff out of bounds, which of course you never want to see, stating the obvious. Yeah, that was a, that was just a, a really a, a, in hindsight, you know that I mean obviously we didn't call uh, the, the kick out of bounds, <laughs> um, but uh, in hindsight, yeah, put, putting them in in the extra ten yards of field position was uh, really hurtful on that particular drive. That was their ended up being their longest drive of the day and their lone scoring drive, and they scored in only the one quarter. And generally speaking, when BYU holds a team a scoreless in three quarters, they're going to win the game. Didn't turn out that way on Saturday. Heading into a break on the coordinators. When we come back, more from special teams coordinator Ed Lamb. If you have questions for Coach Lamb, we invite you to send them in with hashtag CCBYU on Twitter. Back with more right after this. They prefer to be bringing the heat, getting set for success, demonstrating their drive. But when their blood and sweat turns to tears or anything else, we lay the groundwork for BYU's athletes to hit the ground running again. 
and you as well. Intermountain Healthcare, official medical provider for BYU Athletics. Dinner after the game at JCW's includes something for everybody, from burgers to wings, shakes to salads. JCW's quality and a lot of it in Lehigh, American Fork, Provo, South Jordan, and coming soon to Harriman. BYU now suddenly two-thirds of the way through the 2018 regular season. Cougs at 4-4 four and four on the year. Kalani Sitake also all even for his BYU coaching tenure at 17-17. and 17. This Saturday night, BYU plays at Boise State, playing for a first-ever win on the blue turf at Albertson Stadium. Cougars are 0-4 there all time. BYU Special Teams Coordinator Ed Lamb with us now. And uh, Coach Lamb, uh, taking away last year's season ender versus Hawaii, after which there was no game to follow, BYU is 1-6 is in, in games right after wins over the last two seasons. It's been hard to get on a roll uh, for whatever reason. When you look at that, what do you see in terms of either a tendency or an issue that either you've tried to address or might need addressing, or is it just football? Well, I know, you know, over time, we're, um, we always try to um, sustain success, and that's a that's probably the biggest challenge in football is generally you get a very motivated team coming off of a loss. I think I think um, one one thing that uh, coaches really have to do it's our job to to look at to look at um, examples like that, but not to overreact. And so, um, you know, on on one hand, I'll say. Um, that's not a surprising stat for mm. a 500 team, and that's that's what we've been over the last three years, and uh, it's it's unacceptable. Um, the the question is not whether or not it's been acceptable or good enough. The question is, can we get better? Can we can we improve? And I think there are, there are a lot more variables than say, um, gosh, after every time we win, uh, maybe the coaches are too easy on the players, or maybe the players are too. Uh, too comfortable and and you know i think i think there's just there are so many more variables uh, i think a lot of times on our losses probably the most common factor is you know how good was the opponent and, and how good was the opponent on that day so we we look at those things mm. we want to get better as coaches we want to help lead our team to to victories and if it doesn't happen all criticism is justified and so any any criticism that would point to the reasons why that uh, we we haven't been as successful after wins it's justified and legitimate. Well, the psyche gets dented a bit with the home loss on Saturday. And then, uh, as Kalani kind of referenced in postgame, this team, when they've kind of been, uh, you know, backed up again or, or taken a hit, have tended to respond, to respond pretty well and in tough situations. And you've got one coming up here Saturday up in Idaho. Yeah, that, that's right. And that's, uh, that's, that's competitive people. And we, so we have competitive guys. It's our job to try to tap into that, uh, not just after losses and after wins. And we're... In uh, in a very real sense, we're moving on 100% with preparation for this this Boise State week. And if we're fortunate enough to get a win, then we start to look back on, okay, now how do we string two in a row together and how do we learn from the past failures? Moving on to Boise, but looking back for a moment or two at NIU relative to your areas of responsibility, how did you look at the overall special teams performance, kind of taking the individual units maybe one by one a little bit and, and saying where it was uh, good enough and not good enough? 
Um, not not good enough from a loss standpoint. We uh, in a close game like that, special teams can make the difference. And I, I already referenced. I thought their their final punt made the difference. We had some really good special teams plays. We had uh, one of our our better kickoff returns of the of the season, uh, both execution and, and the result. Was, and that was think, Tyler Algier, right? Tyler Algier, yeah. yeah. And and he was able to find an opening and make it make a guy miss and get vertical up the field. Some good blocks on the play. There was some great uh, execution in the punt and the kickoff coverage, and uh, the the punter uh, himself, Rhett Allman, had a really really solid game. We we pinned them on the one yard line once, but uh, in the final analysis, uh, one more field goal wins the game, and uh, our offense would have done what uh, was necessary to win a defensive struggle, and those those are have to happen. And uh, just like defense gets credit in a forty something to forty something uh, uh, victory for getting the stop that mattered. A field goal would have made all the difference there. 12 years and a day since BYU's last 50-yard field goal, and we expect Skyler, Skyler Southam to ha- be that long leg that BYU's been lacking for a while. Uh, he has gone 0 for 2 outside 50, but the distance is there, as we saw again on, on Saturday, right? Distance is there. Yep, distance is there, and uh, my confidence in him is there, and it just goes back to that, that question. You know, the, the TV announcers will, will typically ask me before every game, well, what's, what's his range? And I Again, I always have a hard like. Well, what is range to you? Is it is it eighty percent? Because we we practice so often. I know where he's ninety percent, where he's eighty percent, where he's seventy five, sixty five, et cetera. And outside of fifty yards, uh, the range is there, but uh, that that the margin for error on on the trajectory or the angle becomes a lot different outside of fifty. Uh, what does a special teams coach or a kicker see beyond what the fan sees when a fifty yard field goal is missed? How did he, uh, for lack of a better term, explain the miss? Uh, well, he, I thought he did a smart thing. Num- number one, he played for his draw. He, he hits uh, nine out of ten times. He's got a little bit of a draw on the ball. On that particular kick, the ball did not draw. And uh, so he put it up there just uh, at the right upright, and uh, the, his angle was uh, one to two degrees off. It was headed for uh, about one foot right of the, up, of the right upright the whole time, and that's where it stayed. Okay. Uh, there was a muff punt in this game with a recovery, right, um, for BYU? Uh we, we yeah we recovered yeah. our own muff yeah. punt yes yeah. yes alertly uh, affirmative yeah, yeah. It, it was a, a a poor decision um uh, to try to to field that over the shoulder and break a tackle all simultaneously that should have been a fair catch mm. and uh an an amazing um effort and uh to to get that to ball get to back. it yeah he yeah. he was uh pouncing and and scrambling on all fours and and really you know really the, I got a I got to coach him on the moment, uh, coach him better going into that moment, uh, coach him after the moment and make sure there's a correction and then uh, praise him for the, the amazing effort to get that thing back. Applaud the effort. Looking at uh, linebackers now, your other area of immediate responsibility, top two tacklers in the game were uh, Sione Takitaki and Isaiah Kofusi. And we'll get to Corbin, the other Kofusi, in a moment here, but uh, Isaiah's seen more reps and how would you say he's coming along here in his first real sustained action? Oh, he's, he, in, in my mind, he's the most improved player that I work with on the team um, from spring practice until now. I, I did not anticipate him playing a big role. I thought uh, I thought he was not ready, and then uh, over the summertime, you know, he's got a, he's got a, a long, lean body, and it's so hard it's hard for him to gain some weight. And I really felt like he needed to gain a lot more weight in order to be effective, and he gained some, um, but uh, the, he has completely. Uh, outperform my expectations and, and that's difficult to do for me because I'm super optimistic with the guys I set really high goals for them and I, I believe in in all of their best potential but uh, he's he's been just amazing and a word about Corbin before the break uh, in different situations in different games he's occupied more of a hybrid role and doing a lot for you at different spots he does his length is uh, can be a real problem in passing lanes for opponents uh, several times in this past game again that showed up in the game before uh, against Hawaii uh, going back to the first game of the year against Arizona yep. with a, with a healthy Khalil Tate that was very dangerous he he was absolutely uh, you know just a, a major problem um, he can be a major problem for quarterbacks when he's in that position it's kind of a uh, you know, we have a few different words for it, but a spy or a trigger, somebody who's brop, dropping into a short zone on pass coverage, but also has the uh, the freedom to go and, and rush the passer when, when the situation dictates. He's done a tremendous job of that. All right, coming up next, more with BYU Special Teams Coordinator Ed Lamb, including your questions for the coach using hashtag CCBYU. If you have a question for Coach Lamb, send it on in right now. Hashtag CCBYU. This is the Coordinator's Corner brought to you by JCW's, the Burger Boys. Back with more right after this. AAA agents like Leticia are popping up where people are having doubts about insurance. Like when it comes time to buy a car. So how can I help you today? What if I decide to become a rideshare driver? If you want to outsmart insurance doubt, visit a AAA branch. 
Call it a path. Or way through. It can be arrow straight, or have twists and turns. It's life's financial journey, and Mountain America Credit Union is here to guide you every step of the way. With timely advice and affordable products, this is your journey. Let's begin together. We're Mountain America, guiding you forward. AAA agents like Octavia are popping up where people are having doubts about insurance. Like here, where Makai is learning to drive. What brings you in today? When I get my car, can my friends drive it as well? If you want to outsmart insurance doubt, visit a AAA branch. I feel like we're home right here. I've been given a task, and that task is to task you with other people's tasks. Okay! Let's do this real quick. Now one more, you're gonna touch your nose. BYU fans, you are in the coordinator's corner brought to you by JCW's, the Burger Boys. BYU at Boise State this Saturday. BYU at 4-4, four and four, still two wins away from postseason eligibility. And at least one of those wins will have to come on the road where BYU is 2-1 and one this season. Coach Ed Lamb with me now. And, uh, Coach, maybe just about that. Uh, you've won two of your three away from home. Something about this team that uh, tends to rally around a little bit when they're away from Lavelle Edwards Stadium, perhaps? Uh, I think so, uh, and that, that's. Uh, I think a lot of teams play well on the road. Getting the win it has uh, as much to do with the matchup itself and and how well your team plays on that day. But yeah, there's uh, certainly fewer distractions on the road, and um, and I think everybody's uh, you know or, um, competitiveness, competitive desire, competitive nature is uh, you know it's heightened in an in, in a hostile environment, and so. Get excited about home games, playing in front of the home fans, which we love to, to treat to a victory and to hard play. And, and same on the road. There's just a new set of challenges, new set of opportunities. BYU will have a second straight season without a winning home record, and these guys want to win in front of their home fans as much as anybody, more than any fan would want, certainly. Uh, is there anything about uh, the home field, uh, as you've seen it, that are guys any either either more focused or too tight i'm just throwing things out there yeah. wondering what happens here at home lately yeah no I, and I, I always appreciate your questions you work so hard to find patterns and look at the stats and um and and certainly all those things are up for discussion i, I think um i think for the most part um you know it, it, pattern wise and generalizing an answer it, it's really about the execution of of that particular day and, and that, that opponent that, on that day that and opponent all, yeah. that matchup and uh you know, there was nothing different about our approach, our meeting schedule, uh, the head coach's speech from the Hawaii win uh, to to the um, the loss this last week against Northern Illinois. You know, there's uh, both on both occasions. It's a solid week of practice, a motivated team, players that would give anything to give the home fans a victory and give give each other a victory and. We're uh, disappointed, and as I've, I've said before, no no criticism is unwarranted or invalid. But uh, you know, in, in our estimation, it has a lot more to do with the execution on that day. I came up on the BYU broadcast crew pack back in the 90s on the radio when most Saturday games were afternoon games, and I, I spent a lot of Saturday afternoons walking the sideline with the headset on at Lavelle Edwards Stadium uh, through many falls in the mid-90s to late 90s. And we were back there again uh, this past Saturday, a mid-afternoon game on a Saturday in late fall. It felt great. The result wasn't great, but uh, it just felt like that's that's what football is supposed to be like. It is, and it's it's a shame, you know. For the uh, just take it from this perspective, you know, I think sometimes people want to get to, well. What is the head coach doing that's not leading to victories at home or something like that? You know, the 
on on this particular game, other games would be different, but on this particular game, the the guys on defense executed and performed really well. If and if if people think that uh, Iowa or Utah has a this great defense that always plays lights out, well, guess what? BYU outperformed against a common opponent against that team. So uh, that that part of the team was ready, and that part of the team played hard. And actually, in in my estimation, the offense and the special teams played their guts out too, and they were ready to go and ready to compete. Give some credit to the opponent. And uh, understand that it's about execution and matchups on those days, and that we are we all feel the weight of the loss. Um, you know, as as coaches, I think more than anybody. Understandably, let's uh, hit a couple of different things before we go to uh, Twitter. Uh, what's up with Butch Pau right now? Uh, I think everyone expected him to have a great season at middle linebacker, and it hasn't turned out for him that way. What could you tell us about his current situation and what we maybe can expect from here to the end? Yeah, I think the, you know, without getting too much into the Butch's, uh, you know, personal situation, I think the easiest way to say it is he's he's not quite a hundred percent yet, and uh, the the reality is is, you know, on a team full of guys that are all competing for playing time, uh, it's difficult to win and earn significant playing time without being a hundred percent, and uh, we don't we don't have uh, that many players on the team that are so much better than everybody else that uh, they can go out at uh, whatever the percentage is. I mean, Butch, Butch could tell you more than I could, but it's it's not 100 yet. It's, he's not, not back to 100% strength. Um, he's, he's in there contributing 100% leadership, um, has a has fantastic attitude, is not happy with the, with the decisions that me or the coaching staff is making about his playing time, but 100% supportive of his teammates, and, uh, and that's why I have so much respect for him. He's played hurt and with injury and with repair, right? He's it's not, doesn't not a lot gets talked about, but he has had a physical situation. We're talking about. He, yeah, he he has. He's like yeah. His his situation is that he's not he's not one hundred percent. He's not afraid to play at, at less than one hundred percent and uh, is ready at every moment. If you see him at any moment during the game, it's helmet on, chin strap ready to go, mouthpiece in, and just waiting for the call. Didn't get in against NIU, did he? Uh, no, he, there was a design uh, to get him in based on the rotation, how long a drive is, is going, but they only had uh, two two long drives in the in the game, and there was a different rotation at that on that particular drive. Okay. Uh, from at Dan Haslam on Twitter, how do you motivate your team after a loss? Other than game planning, what gets told to a team? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, another great question, and, and uh, I don't mean to, to answer this in a, in, in a cavalier way, but, uh, you know, motivation – motivation is really a long term in my in my perspective motivation is a long term um tool uh, that coaches use and uh, short term motivation coming off a loss coming off a victory the great halftime speech the great pregame speech they just they don't work and uh and just just simply reasoning it out would would say that it doesn't work if if you have a great halftime speech uh you either have to have equally great halftime speeches every game which players would get kind of like you know they're they're too smart for that or you would you would kind of have an up and down performance as a coach and the same would be true of weekly speeches and weekly messages it's really a long-term motivation to outwork your opponent in the off season in the weight room in the classroom off the field take stress out of your life be a great person and then and then during the season to have a, a motivation a, a motivational tool that lasts the test of time and, and over the weeks. Now, I'll say it this way. Have, have we succeeded as coaches in doing that? No. 4-4 four and four is not up to our expectations. We hold ourselves accountable. It has not been good enough. We have to improve. But uh, no, the, the plan is not to have an amazing motivational um, approach this week. Okay, last thing for you then, Coach Lamb, for this week is uh, is Boise State, a team that uh, can ring it up. Uh, a low-scoring game is a rarity for them. They're really uh, putting up the points right now. Uh, they are, yeah, they're they're fantastic. What a challenge for our guys! I feel like we've really grown in the defensive secondary in the time that uh, that we've been here, and uh, I feel like it's uh, it's going to be a big a big challenge for those guys. Be a big challenge for our pass rushers who have had um, um, not always had it against all of our opponents this year. Have not always had an opportunity to rush the passer. Boise State uh, basically challenge you to challenge us, will challenge us to rush the passer, mm -hmm. and so what an opportunity for our boys to go out and play against one of the best defensively. Boise State has has been really stout and they've done enough to win games and the games that have gone into into higher scoring affairs um they and and maybe most importantly is they know how to win offense defense and special teams so what a challenge for our coaches to to try to get our players in a position to win and a challenge for our players and a great opportunity for us
Last couple of decades, Boise's been an excellent program, and while BYU's not one up there, they're 0-4, three of the four losses were by exactly one point. BYU's gone up there and given these guys a great fight more times than not. Hope, we happen, hope it happens again on, on Saturday night. Oh, count on it. Yeah, it will. The, the boys are going to be ready to play, and as they are every week, and, and going to play incredibly hard, and we feel like that we have, as I've said before, we feel like as coaches that we have a team that can win. We need to do our jobs well and lead them to victory. Coach Lamb, always appreciate your insight. Thanks, Greg. All right, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Coming up after the break, I'll be joined by BYU defensive coordinator Eli Tuiaki as we continue on the Coordinator's Corner, brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys here on BYU TV, BYU Radio, and ESPN 960. Hi. Get ready for some great shows on BYU TV. Tonight at 7 Mountain, it's all new sketches full of all new comedy that will have you rolling. Relax with the family and laugh the night away. Then, when a young pilot stumbles across a prototype jetpack, he becomes a high-flying hero. Enjoy the evening with this comic book to film adaptation of The Rocketeer. Wednesday at 7 Mountain. Watch your favorite BYU TV shows here and catch up anytime on BYUtv.org or the BYU TV app. There are three definitions of the word trick. Number one, a secret strategy or plot. Number two, a prank played on somebody you know or love. And number three, an optical illusion or an act of magic. My name's Eric LeClaire, expert in all three. And I'm teaming up with you on Tricked. Hattie. Feather. Hattie. Feather? This is Hattie Feather, after all. Hattie Feather. Come on, Hattie. Keep it up, Feather. Hattie. Feather. Hattie, outside now. Feather! Hattie. Feather. Dear Hattie. It's Hattie Feather. Hattie Feather. Hattie Feather. Hattie. 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 It's Hattie Feather. A name I've heard many times before. Dinner after the game at JCW's includes something for everybody, from burgers to wings, shakes to salads. JCW's quality and a lot of it in Lehigh, American Fork, Provo, South Jordan, and coming soon to Harriman. We are into the second half of this week's Coordinator's Corner broadcast live on BYU TV and BYU Radio, ESPN 960, as we welcome in defensive coordinator and defensive line coach Elisa Tuiaki. Your questions for Coach Tuiaki can be submitted using the hashtag CCBYU or via comments on BYU Football Facebook Live. BYU coming into the week off a 7-6 to six home loss to Northern Illinois on Saturday. Coach Tuiaki, you give up seven points defensively. You certainly expect to win. Uh, tough one to take that way, right? Yeah, that was tough. You know, it's 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 tough to lose when when uh, in in any time. You Forty-eight, know, just, forty-seven. It's exactly, tough to lose. It's, yeah, it's tough to lose. And so, um, you know, thought thought the kids played hard and and uh, all the way to the end when uh, when uh, we when Coach Sitaka decided to punt it and and we felt really good about the defense getting a stop and getting the ball back and being in position to, to kick a game-winning field goal. But uh, yeah, that, that was just a tough one. Yeah, something Coach Lamb just told us a few moments ago was uh, pretty much everyone on the headset felt like that was the right thing to do at that point on the fourth and four, punt and pin, defense can hold, which they did the entire fourth quarter. And you get the ball back uh, with, with timeouts and two minutes, and you figure you're going to have a shot to, to win that game on a field goal at least. Yeah, yeah, you know, uh, what what Coach Lamb was talking about is exactly right. I'm never really part of that discussion, at least at that time. Um, you know, really the only thing that the, um, that, that Coach Itaka is asking is, do you feel good on defense? And and really he said, I feel good on defense. We're going to stop him on defense and think that our best best opportunity to win is to get a little get, uh, field position here. And, you know, and there's, there's a lot of, you know, my brothers were asking me after the game as well as the crowd, right? There were little, little some questions about whether or not that was the best decision, but – 
um, you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty, and and in this this op- this time, I thought it was it was the right call. Yeah, it can go both ways. I mean, there you know you 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 can say it's the right thing to do to go on fourth and four, and you can say it's the right thing to do to punt and pin, and punt and pin was going to a- appear to turn out to be a, a good strategy, but then the pick on the first offensive play, and and that's your ball game. Um, and I use offense was was not going to be its strong suit coming into the game, but what did concern you most coming into the game that you felt you did a good job taking away from them? Just the run game. You know, I th- I thought that. Uh, they've done a really good job in all the, this whole year, really just run game as well as quarterback run game. And, and don't, uh, not to interrupt, I'm sorry about that, but uh, on the three straight wins coming into the game, they were averaging 250 plus, I think, on the ground uh, coming they, into they Saturday. Were, they were really effective. Yeah. I mean, they, you know, I think that they knew that uh, their cup of tea wasn't to sit back and let the quarterback, you know, throw the ball, but uh, it was really control the run game, control the run game, and and uh, you know, the, you see see in some of the games that they played leading up to us, it was. They had the lead, and they 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 did a good job just running the ball on first, second, and third, and punting it and being okay with it. And so, we felt like we needed to stop the run, um, and thought the boys played hard and did that. At various times against various teams, we've seen Corbin Kofusi kind of being your X factor hybrid guy. How did you want to use him, and how right now do you look at Corbin? What is he for you right now? He's, uh, <laughs> you know, we talk about it uh, um, every every Monday, really, as a staff about who's the player of the game. Um, you know who who who's the X factor, and and he's up for it every single week, and and uh, really he deserves it every single week. And there's definitely guys that that aren't necessarily going to going to get that accolade just because of the way that they play. Like Chris Wilcox at corner, you know some of the defensive linemen up front doing a really good job. And this this week we decided to go with uh, with uh, Metti Italia Uli as the guy that really did a good job holding the front down, especially when Kyrus went down. But um, you know, Corbin every single week is is a candidate for Player of the Week because the way that the things that he brings to the table. He's more than just a simple. He's more than more than a typical D end right now. He is. He is. He's a. He's just in the way. You know, he's just in the way. And and I think uh, when when quarterbacks see him or or when uh, you know they're in the run game, he's scoring me. In the pass game, he's kind of in the way. And when quarterbacks are trying to run, it's just hard to run away from a guy like that. Uh, Saturday was the uh, Cancer Awareness Week game, so everyone had the p- uh, had the pink accessories on. There's Corbin with his bright pink arm brace, elbow <laughs> brace on. So clearly, he's playing ding right now and doing a good job. He is. He is. He he came back uh, with that elbow brace on Tuesday's practice, and I wasn't even thinking about it. But really, when I looked at it, I was like, that that's just that's just Corbin, you know. <laughs> I think if it was just any other week of of the of the year, it wouldn't have surprised me that he picked the pink brace. He's just he's just a character like that. The fact that he's grinding the way he is, he's clearly not all the way right, but he's giving it a go and and wanted to finish this thing out right. Clearly, yeah, yep, he is. And there's there's been talk about him, um, you know, either getting surgery before the season's finished or after, and. And he and his parents made that decision, and mm-hmm. he was adamant about, no, I'm going to finish this thing through, and I want to play, and, I, and he's doing a really good job. Oh, good for him. Uh, you mentioned uh, Metti Talia Uli a moment ago, and this just brings me a thought to mind. There was a play, uh, there was a play in the game where one of the tackles is chasing down Childers toward the sideline, and I realized, wait, that's, that's Jetty Tuiloma. Uh, <laughs> you're playing a lot of different guys right now. Tell us who Jetty Tuiloma is and what kind of trust you have in him right now. <laughs> Jetty uh, <clears throat> Jetty Tuiloma is, is uh, one of our walk-on defensive tackles. He and Kamalani are are two. We call them the cockroaches. Those it's two Kamalani Kaluyokalani, by the way. You know, I, I couldn't have pronounced it. So. <laughs> but uh, th- those two really um, are guys that that have have been in the program, and done a really good job on. Uh, you know, they're 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 scout team guys, and they do a phenomenal job, and they they relish their role. Um, you know, this week with with having guys banged up, we had we had Austin Chambers banged up as well as as Kyrus, and I didn't you know didn't know how comfortable we felt with Kyrus playing the whole time, um, and so we felt like we needed to dress those guys and just have them ready, and uh, you know we we got into a situation a situation where we needed a, to rotate to go from one package to the other, and we did. The guy that was supposed to go in wasn't wasn't ready or wasn't listening, hmm. and Jetty just goes running out there, and I was like, that's that's good. You gotta love that. <laughs> you got, I was really I mean, and you know exactly what you said right it's all of a sudden jetty comes popping free chasing the quarterback yeah. and i was happy for him because it's uh, he got in the game uh in a moment where it mattered and and did a really good job uh kalani told me in pregame that he wasn't quite sure he'd be able to start kairos and then i think there's a point where kairos leaves the game and doesn't come back um how worried should we be about to kairos's ability to either play saturday at boise or be ready uh, for the stretch run here you know l- leading up to the game um yeah, so see, you know, he he got dinged up on Tuesday and didn't practice Wednesday. Came back practice Thursday, but um, you know, looking back at it now, I I 
wish I wish that we would have just held him, you know, because mm. I think we would have got him back a little bit more confidently. I think I think he is, there's still opportunity or chance that he could be ready, but uh, he could have used the rest, you know, and and uh, just hate to put a guy out there and, and get re-injured like that when he could have used the rest. And so, mm. you know, but that that's him. I mean, he was. He was kind of looking at me sideways when I when I told him to when we were doing walkthroughs and all that leading up to the game. I said, "Rotate in with the fours. Just be ready. Know what you're doing." He looked at me like, "I'm playing. Like I'm playing, right?" <laughs> and so he's a kid that that's tough. He wants to play. He wants to contribute. But you know, just for his sake, thing. You know, I wish looking back at it now, I wish we would have saved him. Mm. Are you okay on numbers right now at tackle? Uh, we are, you, you know, we are, and like like I said, Jetty, um, Jetty, and Kamalani do a really good job. I and mean, they're they're both really stout. Um, they're not as big as the other guys, but we call them the, the cockroaches. Those two are indestructible, and they do a really good job just, you know, toughing things out and giving a good look on the scout team as well as just being ready to play for us. And I've got uh, no fear putting those two in just because I know that they'll hold ground. And that's always kind of the, you know, my fear if for a de- defensive lineman to come in and just – get blown up, get driven back. Yeah, give ground. And so those two do a really good job at least holding space, holding their ground, letting the backers flow. Not often that uh, cockroach is a compliment, but it is here. Those two are cockroaches, man. Like cucaracha. Those guys are tough. (laughs) Break time on the coordinator's corner. When we come back, we'll have more with defensive coordinator Eli Satuiaki. Stay with us. When my grandfather started this company in 1947, he couldn't have envisioned what we would ultimately become. We realized that our value to our customers is that we will be there day after day, year after year, doing whatever we need to to find solutions to the challenges that they face. We are committed to be honestly better in all that we do, in every opportunity that we have to serve our customers. Tomorrow on BYU Football with Kalani Sitake, the coach recaps the NIU game, previews the matchup with Boise State, and answers your questions using the hashtag Sitake Show. Watch BYU Football with Kalani Sitake tomorrow at 8 Eastern on BYU TV. Bruh, I ain't got no chill. The BYU TV Sports Countdown to kick off. BYU at Boise State, Saturday on BYU TV. And App Envy. Watch BYU Sports Nation on BYU TV and BYU Radio apps. I didn't think that would go public. Okay, that's it. Roommate meeting. Okay, I do have a few questions. (laughs) Oh my goodness! (laughs) What happened to your brain? Hi, Grandpa. I'm hungry. Let's change the subject, okay? Do you want a doggy bag for that? Okay, got it, got it. You got it? Okay. The Coordinator's Corner brought to you as always by JCW's, the Burger Boys, BYU defensive line coach and defensive coordinator Eli Tuiaki with me until the top of the hour this week. It's 4-4, four and four, BYU visiting 6-2, and two, Boise State. Uh, the Broncos already bowl eligible, and uh, Coach Tuiaki, BYU still two wins away from getting there, but that's a reasonable goal and one you certainly hope to hit here before you get 12 games on the year. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's the goal in mind right now. and. And, uh, you know, whatever happened these last few weeks, we just got to put it behind us and we got to go get our goal. Uh, we've got to go get two more. <clears throat> Leading tacklers in the uh, NIU game, going back to Saturday for a moment, were Sione Takitaki and Isaiah Kofusi, a couple of linebackers. And uh, Sione playing more in the middle where he was on the outside earlier. And Isaiah Kofusi is somebody that Coach Lamb told us in his segment was somebody he didn't know would occupy as large a role as he has right now, but he's been a great player for you. Yeah, Isaiah's done a really good job, um, really, really good job with his development. I mean, he's a, he's a smart kid. 
Um, Coach Lamb's done a really good job with his development, and he's worked hard at it. But, uh, you know, just becoming more physical, more headsy, and just looking exactly like how he did in high school. I thought he was a really good player in high school, and he's uh, look, looking like, like that type of form right now. So uh, who are the linebackers you're counting on right now? It almost looks like Corbin's one of them sometimes uh, when, you, when you open the game uh, the way you do. But uh, you've got Isaiah, you've got Sione. Uh, Riggs Powell, I guess, is somebody else you're turning to. R- Riggs Powell. Yep, Riggs Powell absolutely has a, has a role. Um, Adam Polsfer has a role. And, um, you know, Rhett Sandlin comes in as, as the backup to, to Isaiah at the, at the bullbacker spot. And and uh, really lately with a lot of the teams that we've been playing, we've been playing a lot of nickel. And so right. we've used Mike Shelton. Four two five and mm-hmm. yeah. Yep. Used Mike Shelton as well as uh, uh, Tanner Jacobson at, at the flashbacker spot instead of a backer. It's all about adaptability. You come into the year thinking it's going to be Zane Anderson, Butch Pau, and Sione, and then it's something totally different, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and those guys are those those guys are doing a good job. Great conditioning by the defense, and what shows up, as I mentioned earlier, I think I did with you, uh, NIU averaged less than a yard per play in the fourth quarter, and and, and that's something that's that's uh, you know tough to do to keep any team under a yard per play, and especially late in the game. And so your guys, I thought, uh, did all you needed to do to give the offense a chance to win it. Didn't turn out that way, but your guys played strong to the end. They play they played hard. They they were um, I mean a phenomenal effort. Um, great belief in in the the fact that we were going to be able to to make stops and get the ball back and win it and um, you know wish we could have taken that one drive back straight out straight out of halftime third quarter I think that would have been the, the difference for us on defense or the difference that we could have made in the game and, and being able to win and really when we went back and looked at it as a staff it was just it's just mistakes and and uh, you know just not being in the right place at the right time. But uh, you, but you're absolutely right. In the fourth quarter, they played really, really hard. Interestingly, uh, in the last four games, the opponent has scored a touchdown on their first drive of the second half when they're not scoring touchdowns to begin games on you. And that's uh, that's something that we're talking about as a staff. You know, it's we've, we've got to put more urgency into that. We've got to do a better job. Um, when we come out and start on defense to get a stop, we've got to we've got to get a stop. And I don't I don't like uh, using the language of we got to get a three and out. We we just got to get a stop because, you know, all of a sudden you come out and you don't get a three and out, and then, you know, it's just all kind of negative feelings. It's just we've we've got to get a stop. And we have to do a better job uh, showing up straight at halftime. Or the offense knows it's important to score in the first possession, but if you don't, you can't have everyone sag going, well, there goes that. You still yeah. got to hang in there. Yep, yep. Uh, so the last time BYU lost a 7-6 game was actually at, at Boise State uh, six years ago. BYU goes up there this Saturday. They'll be a heavy underdog, but you, hey, you were a heavy under, underdog in, in Tucson, in Madison, in Seattle. Uh, so you've been here before, and you've won two of those three games. You've picked up wins in two of those three cities. And so uh, you know what it's like to have someone saying, ah, there, there's not much of a shot here. Uh, you've gone in and gotten wins at tough places to play. Just go do it again, right? Yeah, we've got to play well in all phases, you know, and, and everybody knows that. We know that as coaches and the players know that. We've we've got to execute on uh, in all phases of the game. Um, and uh, I think we do that. We'll have, we'll have a good chance just like any other week. Is there something about this team that, 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 that does respond well uh, uh, to adversity? It's been tough to string back-to-back wins together, but by the same token, uh, once you take a loss, it almost feels like uh, – there's a refocus and there's an improved effort the next week. You'd like it not to come to that, but do you feel this team has that characteristic? I think I think it uh, trickles down from from the top. You know, Coach Sitaka does a really good job focusing on on what's important. Um, you know, and I think there's <clears throat> been been a lot of different teams where it was just you know dark and gloomy in the in the office as well as just in the practice field. But uh, he uh, he does a good job just helping the kids get over it to understand what's what's important and and uh, really point out what we need to get better at and improve and and uh, get them you know get them refreshed and starting over again and I think we'll we'll be able to do that this week again. The NIU game gave you a Saturday 130 kickoff on a day that I think hit 70 degrees. It was a perfect day for football. I wish there were more fans in the stands especially from the student section this past weekend. Not your thing to worry about necessarily. You're most worried that you give the fans a win to see and the home wins haven't been as plentiful as you'd like here the last couple of seasons but like Coach Lamb said you can't overgeneralize and say we're not doing something right at home as much as you simply want to play well enough to have those fans uh, wanted to come back and support you week in week out yeah yeah that's absolutely right and and uh, i'm sure coach lamb put it the right way it's uh we've we've got to win and and it's not anything that's that's specific to home or away we've just we've just got to win we've got to play well got to do a better job we have to coach harder we have to get those guys ready to play and, and produce on the field but fall football is where it's at on a day like saturday though it had to be great to be out there at 1 30 in the afternoon oh, that's so the way it's nice. supposed to be <laughs> It was so nice, really, really nice, and, and a win would have 
would have made it nice. Made it a lot better, but it was yeah. really, really nice out there. All right, heading to break on the coordinator's corner. When we return your social media questions using hashtag CCBYU for defensive coordinator and D-line coach Eli Satuiaki. As we continue live on BYU TV, BYU Radio, and ESPN 960. Back after this. In the timeline of life, you make choices every day. Like buying your first car, what a beaut. Or serving your mission, you come home and hop right into college. And then that magic day comes, marriage. Getting married is incredible and pricey. But you know what? Children are even pricier. Your family grows and you need that first home. No matter where you are in the timeline of life, Deseret First Credit Union is right there with you. DFCU, your values, your timeline, your financial future. Next time on another reunion episode of The Story Trek, an update on the bullied beauty queen. They ended up writing me a death threat and told me in detail how they wished to kill me. How sharing her story is changing lives. And years ago, I met a couple desperately hoping the niece they were caring for wouldn't be taken away. It will kill me. <laughs> and my husband. We're praying that it doesn't. Where is their angel now? Join me tomorrow on The Story Trek. This October, see the good in the world with exciting shows on BYU TV. Laugh till you cry with all new episodes of your favorite sketch comedy known as Studio C, Mondays at 7 Mountain. Visit with Kalani Satake as we discuss the BYU football team on BYU Football with Kalani Satake, Tuesdays at 6 Mountain. It's a new season of Relative Race with more puzzles, relatives, and surprises along the way, Sundays at 7 Mountain. There's something for everyone here on BYU TV. I'm Dave McCann. Tomorrow on After Further Review, we review Northern Illinois and preview Boise State. Best hour of BYU football on TV. Blaine Fowler, David Nixon, Brian Logan. We'll be ready to go tomorrow on BYU TV. We're all in to BYU TV Sports. Watch BYU take on Westminster live this Thursday at 9 Eastern, 7 Mountain. Watch all of your favorite BYU teams on BYU TV, your home for Cougar Sports. Dinner after the game at JCW's includes something for everybody, from burgers to wings, shakes to salads, JCW's quality, and a lot of it. In Lehigh, American Fork, Provo, South Jordan, and coming soon to Harriman. Defensive line coach, D coordinator, Eli Satuyaki with us for a few more moments here. Uh, this time of year, most teams in the country are playing for conference championships, those kinds of things. BYU, as an independent, plays for other things. What are, Coach Tuiaki, the way you see it, uh, some of the benefits and challenges of independence at this time of year for you and your squad? I think if you're playing well, especially with the, the schedule that we have, then you have an opportunity to really play for something big, you know, um, especially, you know, looking at our schedule that if we were to come out of the, the first couple of months um, really untainted, we'd be looking at something like really, really big. Um, and so that, I think that uh, being independent always allows you to, to be able to play for that. But, uh, you know, right now for us, after the schedule's done, I mean, we're looking – Utah sometimes falls in the, in the beginning or at the end, but right now, at least this year, where that's uh, that's one that's that's in front of us that we need to be, be prepared for, and they're playing they're playing well right now. What was more uh, what what was uh, more telling about your team in getting to three and one that maybe hasn't been there uh, in as great a quantity in the last four games, which have gone one and three for you? How do you kind of see that? You know, there, we've uh, we've we've taken some lumps. You know, losing a couple guys here and there. Um, personnel wise. Personnel wise. Personnel yeah. wise. Right. It's it's always nice when you have everyone that you started fall camp with and you feel <clears throat> really good about. But you don't have to shuffle things around and move guys to different spots. And and uh, you know, I think uh, so really one of, one of the weeks, the short week, was really tough for us to kind of get back from a loss. Uh, early in the morning and get a quick turnaround and, and get ready for a team that had it by. I think that was that was rough on the kids and as well as the coaches. But um, you know, we're talking about the Washington to Utah State turnaround. Yeah, that one? yeah you know that, that turnaround's tough, and you lose you lose kids, and uh, you know, obviously the momentum, right? You, when you're winning and you feel like you're playing well, then it's everything's good. But uh, the losses can kind of you know, as, as a coaching staff, losses will always make you look at every little detail and sometimes you attribute it to the loss sometimes you don't but you always have to look at everything a little bit more detailed and figure out whether or not this this is uh, playing into your into the way that your kids are playing into your losses or if it's something that's probably doesn't matter and when you're winning it's 
you know, it's, it doesn't matter <laughs> because you're winning. But when you're losing, it's like, how about this? How about this? Well, we looked at this. Have we done this? Are we doing too much of this? Are we doing not, not enough of this? It's just sometimes it could be a little, uh, you could o- overanalyze a little bit. But, um, you know, also I think it's just playing some good teams. Part of it is personnel related, I'm sure, and losing Zane. Um, have you settled into um, maybe a nickel philosophy for the remainder of the season, or will it still be game dependent and opponent dependent? I think it's I think it's still a little bit game dependent as well as opponent dependent. It just depends on on uh, how we feel they're using certain personnel. If we feel like we need to get a, a bigger guy in there, a guy you know a little bit more run run heavy and run stop then we'll, we'll rely a little bit more on backers as well as defensive linemen. And when it comes to teams, if, if we feel like we can we can stop the run and we can hold the edge as well as still get some speed out there with some of our nickels, then we'll do that. But it's still really dependent on, on what we're seeing on film. Okay. Uh, from social media, at BYankee0103 on Twitter, uh, what goes into your plans to substitute or platoon so frequently play-to-play? When they, when they when, Normally when they sub, we sub, right? And the, uh, this last team... Um, Northern Illinois went from 12 personnel to 10 personnel, um, back and forth, a little bit of 11 personnel, and that's that's really the way that we do it. And um, you know, for us, then this last week we had a we had what we call the beast package, which is three D tackles and two D ends. Um, yeah. And there's only certain certain amount of the calls that we have in the beast package, and so you know if we feel like we're getting stuck in the beast package, don't like the calls as much, but we're getting 12 personnel, then we might go back to a big package, which is four D tackles or you know strong package, which is three D tackles and one D end, and and bring a nickel in. And so it just just depends on on the calls. We don't we don't uh, I think I think you you can, but we don't. I don't believe in in carrying too many calls i think that kids start getting it scrambled in their heads i get it scrambled in my head and it's probably it's probably because i'm not not as smart i can't carry as many calls and so we try to keep it to a minimum and get the kids playing fast and but uh everything really is you know uh, packaged by by personnel for us so that we know exactly what calls we're going in the game with and we know what uh what calls are going to be there in certain packages. Can you remind us uh, which defensive coaches are on field and which are in booth in the course of a game and how you planned that out and why you went with that plan yeah, uh, you know when we started the start of the year, all four of us were on the were on the field, and, and for the last three years we've been doing that. It was really something that uh, uh, Coach Itaka brought and and uh, really liked it. Is we had all four coaches on the field defensively. We put the graduate assistants up in the box with uh, with our analyst, and I think the idea behind that was the kids throughout the week hear our voices, and we're coaching them in person, eye to eye, seeing their face, and feeling the emotion of it. And the GAs, our graduate assistants, are the ones that are breaking down the film. They're the ones that are, you know, kind of putting stats together and, and uh, getting all that ready. And they're seeing uh, seeing a lot of the film, even the ones that we don't break down. But they're seeing all of it, and they know how to tag it. And, and when they get up in the box, they're able to see it exactly like they do, and we're able to stay in front of our kids. Um, the one change that we made uh, was it versus Hawaii one versus one one change that we made was we put uh, coach Lamb in the box normally coach Lamb's on the ground as a special teams coordinator it's kind of hard to do that but we we split up special teams he's still the the guy that heads everything but I'm in charge of kickoff and you know coach uh, Stewart is in charge of uh, uh, punt return kick return and coach Galani has has punt but uh, coach Lamb still calls all of it from the, from the box was he was he booth again for NIU <laughs> He was. Will he stay there the rest of the year? That'd be a uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. I really, really like the setup right now, and really, um, you know, it's it's for us. It's um, getting him, getting him up there was uh, was good for us to be able for him to see the whole box. You know, our defensive line, defensive line GA was up there and saw saw what was going on with the with the D line, but seeing the whole run fit as as it fit together with the linebackers and the D line is better for for Coach Lamb to be up there as well as to just kind of keep his his uh, pulse on the on the game and gotcha. take the emotion out. And so okay. that that was good for him. Hey, last thirty seconds here because it gets talked about a lot more frequently here. Just in the last thirty seconds we have with you, when we talk ten personnel, eleven personnel, twelve personnel, twenty one, whatever the case may be. What do the two numbers refer to in a ten or 11 for example there, there's always five eligibles on the field the first number is the uh the running back the second number is a tight end so a 12 is a running back and two tight ends one running back two tight ends it's five eligible so you always assume that there's two receivers right and so the bigger the personnel the 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 heavier the run tendency and and max pro shot two-man routes and so um, it just kind of changes the game that way. All right. Hey, good luck this weekend at Boise State. Thank you. All right. That is Coach Elisha Tuiaki. That'll do it for the Coordinator's Corner. Back next week with Coach Tuiaki and Offensive Coordinator Jeff Grimes as we review BYU Boise and look ahead 
to a trip back east to Boston. Thanks to producer Jason Shepard, Michael Miner, and the crew from BYU TV and from BYU Radio, Sean O'Neill, Terry South, Sean Fay, intern Sterling Richards, and GM Don Shaline. I'm Greg Grubel. This has been the Coordinator's Corner. We'll talk to you next week, 1 Eastern, 11 a.m. Mountain. So long. I have heard so many stories of what the families that we work with have gone through. There are times when literally I have to step back and wonder if I can hear one more story. Usually when the women come to us, they've reached rock bottom and you know they're looking for a lifeline. How do you not give someone a lifeline? Next on BYU TV. I tell you, working with your, your wife, 